All right, hi guys. Welcome to the live stream. Gonna turn our cork board here into some pavement. I found out that the roll of cork that I bought most recently was four millimeter, where I normally get two millimeter. So uh, we're gonna see how this works out. I've already got some, you know, kind of start from scratch here. I've got, we're gonna make construction wise this piece, which is eight by 18 inches. And then I've already got this nice big piece back here uh, constructed and in primer. And then, so we'll be painting on that one. Um, the four millimeter, the cracks are a little bit more aggressive than with the two millimeter, but it still works. So we'll see. Oh man, all kinds of people. How's everybody doing? Hope you guys are having a, a nice Sunday afternoon. And so here we go. So the first thing you need some sort of baseboard. I like MDF uh, for this. Just it's real easy to work with. It's easy to cut. Um, it is pretty stable as far as laying flat. Um, when you initially glue it or paint it, it will curl a little bit as it absorbs some moisture, but uh, you can lay it flat with some weight and it'll kind of find flat again. This piece back here had a, a bow to it after gluing, but just letting it sit for a day, it, it nice and leveled back out. Once you have your board, cut it to size. Uh, like I said, this one is eight inches by 18 inches because that's what's needed for, for what I'm building this for. Your cork board, you want to cut to roughly the same size. Um, overlapping a little bit on each edge is, is not the worst thing ever because um, you're going to trim it uh, to size once it's glued in place again. So you can see I've got a little bit of overlap on on all of my edges. So what you want to do then, so you get bored. So to put cracks, this material tears very, very easily. And because it's comprised of just a bunch of, of cells of cork, the, the, the natural tear in it, it makes a nice kind of jagged edge. So, um, I guess I should also, it's easy to go overboard with the cracks. You can kind of really just tear it up until you end up with so many little pieces that you don't really remember where everything goes. So what I recommend, especially for the first one or two that you try, keep it really simple. Maybe only try to put one track, one crack. We're doing some weathered pavement for dioramas. So, once you have your cork board and you're ready, so I'm gonna do a crack across this corner over here, where you can see in my hand, let me try. I was struggling to find a good spot for, for my tripod so that I could still see the screen and answer people's questions. So I'm gonna do a crack kind of over in here and then maybe one up through the middle, not over, over the top. So take material and just start tearing a little bit and then I like to kind of let the material kind of find its own where it wants to tear but you can guide it a little bit by putting pressure like so okay so now I've got two pieces you can see that so this met this process this first part here does get a little bit messy just because you're gonna be tearing pieces out. So as it sits right now, if I were to glue this down, the pieces fit back together pretty tight to the point where in some spots you can hardly even tell where the crack is. Once that's primed over and painted over, you might not even see the crack. Other spots it'll be a little bit, a little bit more pronounced. So what I like to do is you can either use sandpaper or even just your fingers and just come through and kind of rub the edge of these cracks. And it'll kind of smooth them out just a little bit. And you're gonna have little pieces come off. Little tiny pieces, some a little bit bigger, but you kind of get a feel for it as you go. But just by cleaning this edge up, and I said, if you got rough hands like I do, it works pretty good, or you can use sandpaper. Um, 
relatively aggressive sandpaper, like in like a hundred grit, uh, maybe even 150. Anything higher than 150 is probably not going to really grab a hold very much. But coming through, clean up the edge so you can see I'm already making. Yeah, the cork does come in multiple thicknesses. This is four millimeter thick, um, which I've used before. It also comes in two millimeter. I actually preferred the two millimeter. I didn't realize that this is what I had ordered um, until just a couple days ago when I was getting my materials ready to start on this project. Um, but it will still work. So coming through, just smoothing out this edge a little bit. If you get kind of a larger chunk that comes off every once in a while, that's totally okay. Uh, depending on the size that comes off, you can actually, if you want, you can keep it and glue it back in um, or leave it out and have like a pothole. Definitely works. So cleaned up those edges and you can see the kind of the the debris that gets generated from from this process so let's go ahead and do one more big crack and then maybe do a compound like that so one thing I try to do as I'm doing this as when I finish a piece I try to set it in my work area in the orientation that it's gonna go back on the board. So that way if I do end up with a lot of smaller pieces, they're not all mixed up and I don't have to I don't have to play jigsaw puzzle to to get them all lined back up again. I'll I'll have a general idea of where it is they're gonna go, which will make it a lot easier when it comes time to glue everything up. I don't have to try to do it in stages. I'll have everything in position so that I can glue it up in one in one go. Oh, nice. Where are you, are you, where are you finding the, the cork with the adhesive on one side? Is that something you find um, on like Amazon or, or somewhere else online? Cause that would definitely be nice and save a step. I guess that makes sense if it's for making like, uh, like poster boards or whatever. Awesome, tell Jeremiah that, that I say hi. There we go. Okay, and then, so just cleaning up with your using your 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 hands like this is a little bit less aggressive, which is nice because it is less likely to kind of catch large pieces and tear them out. Uh, using the sandpaper, it can go a little bit faster, but it definitely is more aggressive, and you're going to end up with more more material being removed and more chance of large pieces, larger than you maybe intended, getting removed. So, you can also put cracks that you don't intend on tearing the, the whole piece off, because that's one thing that kind of is nice for a, a realism effect on the, excuse me, the finished product, is cracks that don't necessarily go all the way across the, the area. Okay. All right. So I've got four pieces total. I'm going to clear them out just a little bit so I can. Okay. So once you've got your, clear this out. I didn't think about cleaning up midway through this process. So that's going to be fun. All right. So nice. That's cool. I'm going to have to look around and see if that's something that I can track down over here. Cause that'll save me a step, uh, a messy step. Okay. So I've got my pieces pretty well lined out. I can puzzle piece them back together just to make sure that everything's going to fit back. Right. And I don't end up with any ridiculous gaps. But you can see what I've got here. Okay, so keeping that. So I've just been using wood glue because it's what I have handy and it works really well for this. Um, I've used Elmer's glue, just good old fashioned white PVA glue in the past. It works well. Tacky glue, uh, other craft glues work. Um, you could probably get away with spray adhesive if you really wanted to. 
um, it would just be trickier trying to get the backside of the, because you want to have both sides of, of a spray adhesive joint sprayed. Um, but, I mean, wood glue is cheap and easily accessible and easy to work with. So when I'm gluing, get the camera here. I usually run a bead around the edge. Excuse me while I focus. I was trying to find a way to have my camera able to capture more of the work area, but I wasn't able to see the screen. And then I wanna just get decent coverage. I don't need every square inch of this board covered, but I wanna have a good solid cover along the edges and the majority of the interior. Um, also, it helps to make sure that anywhere where you've got a, a tear in your cork, the, the cracks, um, that those have good, even coverage so that they can bond down really well and, and make a good, a good, a good joint. I need to clean the nozzle on my glue. So, okay, looks like I'm doing a, a, a Jackson Pollock live stream. Okay, so hopefully that'll be enough for now. I can always add more. Okay, so I'm gonna come in, I wanna use my finger. I wanna kind of make sure that I've got glue all the way out to the edge. If I don't get glue all the way out to the edge, the, the cork is gonna be more likely to wanna like curl back and kinda not be a good, not mounted up right. Almost time for more glue. There we go. You can use brushes for this if you prefer, if you don't like to get glue on your hands. But whatever you need to do to make sure that you can get it nice and spread even on the edges. What are you making? Um, I am making uh, weathered pavement for dioramas. Mainly for car dioramas, but this could work for action figure dioramas. Kind of any scale miniature building that you're doing where you would need... The, the look of asphalt or blacktop or pavement or any of the other names that it has. I use cork board because it has a very uh, similar texture when painted and it can get achieve the look really well. Okay, so again, focusing mostly on the edges of the board with the glue because that's where it's gonna be most likely to not wanna bond. And can always add glue again later. Okay, there we go. Okay, then I've got my pieces laid out. Grab a paper towel. Get the extra glue off my hands. Yeah, age pavement. All right, so now I can come back in and set my pieces. And the, the glue will have enough tack. Just from the, from the time that it's been exposed already, it should be tacky enough that it'll hold the, the cork pretty well in place. Okay, there we go. And then you wanna just kinda of press up. This is a good, this is the, the best time to kind of pay attention to how large the cracks are so that you can make sure, you know, that you don't have them too big so that they look out of scale with whatever you're building or so close together that when they're painted, it'll just completely disappear. So there we go. And then pay a little bit of attention to your edges 
Make sure that you're not kind of creeping on to where you're not going to have any coverage. See, I need a little bit more glue right there. There we go. Okay. All right. And then there we go. All right. And then last piece. Like so. All right. So like that. And then just some good even pressure. What I usually do at this point, let me see if I do, maybe this angle you can see. Oh yeah, there we go, that's a little bit better. So once I get to this point, what I usually like to do is actually find a good flat surface, so either a table or uh, a part of the ground that, that's, that I've swept, and I lay upside down, and I'll put some even weight, so just stack some books on here, or I have like an old car battery that I need to get rid of in the garage, things like that, just something that'll add nice, even, Um, actually, uh, the story for how I got started in dioramas is pretty fun. A couple years ago, I wanted to make a birthday gift for one of my friends. And I had this idea that I thought was going to be great. I was going to make him a clock. Um, and, uh, he's a big car guy and his two favorite cars. He currently has a Miata that he's built like all the way, um, it's turbo suspension, everything. He's taken it to Laguna Seca for track days, he loves it. And his old favorite car was a, a 04 STI. So in my mind, I was gonna make this clock that was gonna have the, the two cars on the hour hand and the minute hand, and they're gonna be like drifting. And so as the clock went around, the two cars would be just like forever drifting with one another. And I thought it was this great idea until I tried to find a clock mechanism that would do it. And so I looked, everywhere i was looking in like clockmaker forums and like german clock websites and like all this weird stuff i could not find a clock mechanism that had the hour hand on top of the minute hand because the hour hand is shorter and so if the, the hour hand is always on the bottom on all these clock mechanisms and so mounting the car to it it would always interfere with the other arm and so it wasn't going to work and i looked and i looked i could not find a, a mechanism that would would work but I had already got the, the Hot Wheels to, to make this project. And so I'm like, well, I guess I'll make a diorama instead. I had recently read an article on Jalopnik at the time, you know, where the, the author um, had said like, hey, you know, we all have Hot Wheels on our desk. Why not like give them something to sit on? And so instead I decided to make a, um, a, a diorama for my friend for his birthday. Um, actually on my YouTube, there's a, a video, uh, one of the, the first diorama videos I did was about uh, making that project. And I had a lot of fun and it got a lot of positive feedback from people that I showed pictures to and I got hooked. And then that was around the same time that I started getting into um, Hot Wheels racing on YouTube. And it's been kind of all downhill from there, pardon the pun. Uh, so anyway, Back to this project. So you have your diet, you have your your cork all, all glued up. Find a nice flat place for it to sit until the the glue is set. With wood glue or even Elmer's glue, it usually only takes you know an hour or two for it to really be completely set up and ready to go. Thank you very much. Once your glue is set, uh, you can use your cutting mat or whatever your cutting surface, and then all of the edges that we kind of had left over to make sure that our fit was right, you can come in through with your with your craft knife and just and just trim all of those edges off until you have a nice a nice clean edge all the way around. Once you get to that point, you've got your cork glued down, you've got your edges all trimmed up, your glue is nice and set, then it's time to prime. So I like using flat black primer uh, it's readily available. It's inexpensive. It does the job really well. 
one of the tricks to priming is because you've got so much texture on here, you've got all these nooks and crannies and the, the surface itself has texture. You want to shoot it with the primer from multiple angles so that the primer can get down into all of the cracks. And even on the, the cork itself, if I just shoot all of my primer in this direction, if I were to turn it around, I would actually be able to see through the primer in large areas across the cork because the part of what makes cork such a good material for this project is the fact that it has that texture even on like the, the, the large flat areas. So you want to make sure and shoot from, from multiple angles so that you get good even coverage in all of those nooks and crannies because you want the, the nooks and crannies to, to stay black which is what is what makes the painting technique work. So speaking of, we'll come over to this one. So I actually noticed when I was looking at this earlier, let me see, yeah, actually in here. So let me see if I can get the camera angle right. This is where I got some of my glue uh, on the top of Uh, water down Mod Podge with black paint. That would potentially work. Um, I get my only real concern with that would be that it would potentially kind of like glaze over the top and maybe fill in some of those surface details that we're kind of looking to keep. Um, like you can see here, even just where I got a little bit of my wood glue on the surface, it, it makes kind of a smooth spot. Um, you can mask that with painting after the fact but I would be concerned that using Mod Podge again across like the whole surface, that it would maybe, they would potentially fill in too much. Um, so you can see, I do have a couple spots here. I'm trying to get the camera angle right, sorry. I don't know if you guys are able to see that, see where the cork is kind of showing through. It's because I didn't shoot from that angle, but it's an easy fix uh, once, I'm, once I'm painting. You just come in, my first pass with painting is going to just be with black paint, looking for those spots that didn't quite get primed all the way. Um, I'm using the same inexpensive, just, you know, super cheap matte black craft paint uh, that I was using for the other live streams for anybody that tuned into those. Same super cheap brushes. Um, I do not recommend good brushes for this because this process is not gentle on brushes. And if you spend good money on a brush, um, your that brush is, is gonna be hurting after, after this. Um, a new thing that I've started doing that I actually kind of like, I was for, for palettes, everybody's got a bunch of pa paper bags laying around now while the grocery stores won't let you uh, like use your own bags. I find that these actually work really well as uh, palettes. So yeah, see, yeah, there you go. That would work great for the, to, for the glue to be oil stain. Okay. So get some black paint and a small brush is what we're looking for here. Cause we want one that can get down into the cracks and, and, and paint those areas that the, that the spray didn't get to. So it doesn't have to be perfect. If a little bit of that cork shows through, that's totally fine. Large cracks like this would potentially have all sorts of dirt and gravel and, and whatnot in them. And by the time we're done, there's going to be so, so much variation kind of painted on here that it'll blend right in. Um, even over time, you know, the cork is going to, is not going to be completely sealed. And so it is still going to potentially crumble a little bit over time, just from, from use, even if you're not necessarily playing on the surface, just moving things around and handling it, little pieces of cork are going to potentially come off. Um, what I've found, like, as I'm watching various YouTube channels that, that I, that use my things I've sent to them, I see you know, because that's I'm always looking for for problems like that. I see where the 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 damage is and where the the pieces have come off. But even talking with my wife, who sees the projects, you know, before they go out, she says that it, you know, it, it just blends right in. It doesn't really. I have to point it out. It doesn't it doesn't jump out to to a casual observer the way it does to me that that, that made it. 
so okay um so using this technique like uh i mentioned in the in the post the the texture will work for just about any scale um like i i work mostly with 164 scale but i've sent kind of parking lot pieces to people that are using these for displaying um models like 124 scale and even 118th scale the 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 texture holds up i don't know about going in smaller um like 187th scale the ho scale i don't know how well it would hold up to to that but i mean it could potentially especially if you really kind of focus on what you're doing and and keep your cracks very very small but depending on what you're doing it, it it would definitely be easier to scale it up so something to to think about if you're doing anything else if you're working for with uh larger scale model cars or if you're doing uh like action figure displays any other type of of a larger larger diorama uh I think I'm not going to make you guys sit here and just watch me paint black on black for too much longer. So I'll probably do just a part of this larger one with the painting process. So, okay, that works. All right. So primer's nice and dry. I've gone through and touched up the the areas where the primer didn't quite make it into some of the nooks and crannies on on here so now i take let's see if you can see this is the brush my my large area dry brushing brush that i like to use is from michael's it was a couple bucks um you can see it's all already pretty pretty rough shape but it does the job really well my first pass uh, after the touch up with black, I like to use just dark gray. I use this straight out of the bottle. Um, it gives a good kind of standard baseline for, for asphalt. The first parking lot type stuff I ever did, I was using rubberized undercoat, like the stuff you spray on your gas tank to pr protect it from road salt and stuff. Uh, and it works really good. But what I was finding was I didn't like the the finished look of it because it was it was too perfect. It looked like when you drive into a parking lot that's just been repaved and no one's driven through it yet, it doesn't it doesn't look right. And so I started kind of paying attention as I was out in the world, and most you know even though we we call it blacktop or whatnot, most of the time parking lots and and everything are are so much lighter gray that you don't even really necessarily notice it until you're looking for it. So. Okay, when it comes time to paint, I like to start on the edges and kind of work in on an area. So, and I usually go in uh, diagonal brush strokes, just nice and light, nice and light, <laughs> bring it in, and then and then come in at a at a ninety degree. Oh, nice. What's up, Adriel? Okay. So, and what you're going to find as you're dragging across like this, the, the, the highs and lows that are naturally part of the, you know, the, the texture of the cork are going to start to really kind of present themselves. Also, as you're laying down, as you have more or less paint on your brush, you're going to end up with areas that are getting more paint or less paint. And you can kind of work with that. You don't have to worry about getting it perfectly even because again, that's not that doesn't really line up with how, how it would, would look and it kind of spoils the effect. So you can kind of play with those areas that are getting more paint and, and work with it and it adds a bit of dimension. I usually try on the cracks to make the darkness of the low parts of the crack really stand out. You can do uh, make sure that the, the edges of the crack end up being a little bit lighter. And so by making sure they get hit with paint, it's gonna make their high spots stand out 
versus the low spots down in the cracks really kind of separate <laughs> and it gives you a, a much more kind of dramatic effect in the eye. You're very welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Okay. And mainly I'm just like with my, with a, only a little bit of paint on my brush. So I keep reaching across the camera. That's how I have my, my stuff set up, but I've got just a little bit of paint on there. And that this is kind of something you just have to feel out for yourself. Uh, what's right because eventually you're gonna you're gonna have that time where you're just gonna come in with way too much paint on the brush and you're gonna drag across and it's gonna just paint an area the color you're going instead of just hitting the high spots and then you kind of have to adapt to it as you go but that's part of the process and part of the fun is adapting okay i can see where some of the black paint I went in a little bit heavy with the black paint in the crevice. I don't know if you guys can see it very well, but right here I've been uh, kind of accidentally drawing that out, which is not ideal. I'm rushing a little bit because I wanted to do the, to paint on the live stream. So definitely when you're going after that initial black coat, it's worthwhile to, to let it have a chance to dry so that you're not dragging it all over the place as you paint over different areas. You can always come back in and touch up over that later on. But so with the gray, it looks really light on that initial pass as it's going on. But then once it does dry, it darkens down quite a bit. And so what you can do what I, excuse me, what I do is once I get over the whole area that I'm doing with kind of the section that I'm doing, once it's, I'm done with that section and everything has kind of had a chance to, that first pass has had a chance to dry up, excuse me, I'll go back in and see kind of where it needs more. Cause by, by doing just an additional pass, over an area so you can see like up here where this is already pretty dry you know i've got like that medium gray and then it kind of gets darker in here where i didn't get as much paint just by coming in with another pass of a brush and getting more paint on there the whole thing kind of lightens up okay the base is uh, just MDF particle board. You can use plywood, you can use uh, chipboard, the stuff that clipboards are made out of, kind of anything that's gonna be nice and flat. Um, and then it's uh, cork board, like what you use for uh, push pin uh, message boards type stuff. Uh, this is four millimeter, but you can get two millimeter and I actually personally prefer the two millimeter. Uh, the way that it that it tears is a is a little bit better in my opinion, but the four millimeter definitely still does the job and the texture is still really good. Uh, paved areas before any grass landscaping, depending on on how you're doing your setup, uh, what has really seemed to work good for kind of incorporating these types of parking lots into an overall setup is just planning ahead and knowing you know exactly what dimensions you're working with so like for instance this piece that i'm doing right now is seven inches by 35 inches and it's one centimeter thick so by knowing those dimensions um the area that this is going to go into can be set up and and kind of finished on its own and then this can be set in and then all you're worried about doing is just kind of disguising and bridging the gap between the the you know, the, the base that you were working from and this piece that's added in. Yeah. That's fine. Um, you know, if you were doing maybe just like one set diorama that was, you know, like a, a 18 by 18 square and you wanted to have a paved area and a, a grassy area on that same diorama, um, I guess it would kind of depend on I'm trying to think how I would how I would approach that. Um, 
I mean, you could do it similarly where you would make this as a separate piece and then attach it on. I think that's what, what I would do. Cause you could just do, um, if that was the case, I think what I'd do. So if I was already working in an area, like a, like I said, like an 18 inch square diorama, that was going to have some natural type features. And I wanted to incorporate a paved area onto that. Um, I would lay out my area and then what I would do is instead of mounting my my cork onto a thick board like this, I would go through the same process, but I would use, um, oh, what am I thinking? Uh, oh, I'm blanking out on the word. Poster board, like a card stock, like what three by five cards are made out of, just like really heavy duty paper. Um, it should hold up well enough, especially if you're pressing it after the fact to, to have the glue joined to it. And then that's gonna give you a piece that you can handle and paint. And then when you go, you can still kind of glue it in and uh, it would work really well uh, the same way. And you would not have to add a bunch of extra depth by having it mounted on a, on a board. So I think that's how I would do it. I would try it that way and it would potentially fail. And then I would have to come up with a different way. But in the, the thought experiment, that's, that's the way that I think I would try it first. Okay. So... I did my first pass over this area. Where are we at here? What I want to do now, let that dry for a second. While that's drying, I'm going to come through and I'm going to make a, a slightly lighter shade of gray. So I'm going to start with just a, a blob of the, and we'll do some exciting, you can see the, what's going on over here. A blob of that same gray that I just used and then just come in with a little bit of white, not a lot, a couple drops. Mix it up. You could also just buy a lighter shade of gray if you don't want to mix. So you can see even with just a couple drops of white, it made a much lighter shade of, of gray to the point I'm actually gonna add some dark back into that because that's too big of a jump. Okay. Yeah, yep, just cheap acrylic paint. Uh, these are all matte finish paints because uh, for the, the aesthetic that I'm going for with this is that kind of dusty, old, you know, kind of weathered. And I find that the, the, the matte finish acrylic paints really accomplish that well. And then if I do need to add anything with gloss, like if I want to add oil drops, then using a gloss oil-based paint, uh, the, the, the gloss really pops out really well against the, the mat. Okay. So now with my lighter shade of gray, I'm going to come in. I'm not looking to cover the entire area, uh, that I had already done. Cause that will bring the whole thing up too light. And I want to make sure and keep some of my kind of dark undertones. And so again, starting at an edge, I'm mainly just looking for, for high spots now. A, a lighter hand on the dry brush. Making sure to hit like along the cracks because like I was saying before, that really helps highlight the crack. It really kind of uh, makes the, the darkness inside the crack deeper down and brings the, the, the edges up for a more dramatic effect. Also, when I'm, when I'm doing an area... I like to kind of look at it and, and, and picture that it's that it's not perfectly flat. A lot of parking lot areas, are, you know, will have a bit of a wave to them. And even though the the actual surface that I'm working with is almost perfectly flat, I can kind of give that same feeling by just picking areas and leaving areas dark while I make other areas bright. And those dark areas are going to seem are going to seem lower, and the bright areas are going to seem higher. So. Like for instance here, you can see it look right here. It's looking like it's 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 kind of making a divot there, a low spot by bringing up this area and this area on the side. And so it kind of gives that undulating kind of wavy feel even though, you know, if you look down this board from the end, it's it's almost perfectly flat. So it kind of gives you that illusion because that's one thing working with with die cast uh, toy cars for, for these dioramas, they want to roll. And, you know, 
it's nice to have a, your display not look like it's just a perfectly flat area. It kind of helps add that that kind of dynamic feel that they're, you know, it's like a, either like a hilly environment or there's just some sort of, of dimension to it. And so by giving an illusion of, of that, it helps make the, the display look a little bit more active, even though the cars are still just sitting on a flat surface. All right. So. Nice. Coming in. All right. So I've done a second pass now with a, with a medium gray. And you can see I'm starting to get kind of high spots and low spots. I'm getting the, the cracks are standing out, all, you know, really well. They look nice and, and, and dark down in there. So it definitely, it, you can tell that that's a crack, which is nice like that. What I want to do now is I want to go clean my brush out because I am going to go in with an even lighter shade. Um, you can do an even lighter gray, or at this point you could even come in with some straight white if you wanted to either way. But what I'm going to do, make sure my brush is nice and dry. There we go. All right. With some light, put that in there. So I'm not going to come with straight white. This is still going to be just a really light gray but it's gonna be really close to white. Part of my mixing. Okay. All right, and so same brush, make sure it's dry. I wanna get most of the paint off again. And what I wanna do is just on the absolute highest spots. So selectively along kind of certain edges of the cracks. If I have, you know, something that I've designated kind of in my mind as a high spot, I'll come in and just over the top of that ever so slightly to kind of pop it up on the edges of these cracks again, a little bit on the edge of the edge of the diorama. And this, this, Real, real light is what's going to really kind of make a, a, a high spot. It's going to make those those pot, those spots just really, really jump out in the in the finished finished deal. You can really highlight your edge that way, which can make the the edge, especially if you leave the the the, the physical edge black, and then get that nice white pop on there. Okay. And then once I've done that kind of pass, I'll do one last highlight with this white where I'm just picking a couple areas and these can be anywhere, but just doing some dabs like this. Cause if you notice, like I found, I spent a lot of time looking at weathered pavement and parking lots now just for kind of inspiration. There's always just random stuff with bird poop or if there was some kind of gravel in the whatever mix they were using when they laid down the, the asphalt. There's always just like random bits of, of really bright in old asphalt. Okay. So I've gone through my grayscale from black where I started with black primer and black to fill in the cracks. Uh, a nice dark gray dry brush for my base coat, a medium gray to start to give a little bit of dimension, a light gray to really hit the high spots, and then just some like pinpoint light gray for, yes, bird poop. Plenty of it. Um, what I like to do now is actually come in with some brown and I make a pretty dark brown. So either start with a really dark brown or take some brown and add a little bit of black to it to really get a nice deep dark brown. Mix that up. You can see what I'm working with is just a, a medium brown that I've added just a couple drops of black to. And I'll come in and mix it up 
into this nice dark brown. That'll work. Clean that off. Okay. So what I want to do with the dark, dark brown is come in, again, very little on the brush. And so we talked about making kind of low spots and high spots, uh, even though the surface itself is flat. The brown kind of coming in to some of these dark spots, these low areas, helps kind of add that dimension of, you know, maybe there was a, a puddle there at one point and it dried up. And so now there's more mud kind of in the, in the asphalt, you just kind of increasing the, the, the depth of color. And it adds a bit of that, you know, instead of it just all being uniform, that's kind of the thing that bugs me when I look at, you know, there's really nice kind of display products that are out there now. Um, that you can get like the mats and things like that. But they, from what I've seen of them, they all just tend to be just kind of too, too monochrome. It's like the, all of the colors come from one, from one color spectrum. You know, they're all grayscale. There's no, there's no variation. There's no browns or or tans or anything coming in. You know, but even just walking out and looking at the street in front of your house, you're gonna see that there's more than just gray going on in that in that asphalt. So, just hit my low areas with a little bit of brown brush cleaned out excuse me little plug for Mountain Dew Major Melon uh, if you like watermelon Jolly Ranchers and are not afraid of diabetes uh, get yourself some of this and drink it it's delicious and it'd probably kill me but it's so good oh my goodness all right Clean my brush. All right, so one of the last colors that I come in with is just a tan, nothing fancy. And so this just to, to kind of stick in the same in the same vein of like, well, why am I putting tan? Uh, dust. Everything's covered in dust. I'm in Central California where everything is made of dust, and so it's everywhere. And it does add just like that. I said that little bit of extra kind of depth. Okay. So with a little bit of tan dry brush, I try to just lightly graze over the areas where I laid down the brown just to add kind of at least a two stage onto that, that color spectrum hit from multiple angles so that you're taking advantage of the, the texture of the material. And then I use the tan with again, just a dry brush as not necessarily like a full, I don't go over every square inch of everything, but I cover over a good portion. Uh, it helps kind of bring down any of the spots where we went with the really, really bright light gray, the almost white. If those are standing out too much, a little bit of tan over them helps bring them down a little bit. And then also likewise areas where maybe you didn't get enough gray down and it's a little bit too dark a little bit of this tan kind of brings it up, kind of brings everything towards the middle without completely eliminating the fact that, you know, that we've got multiple colors and, and kind of multiple values going on here. Okay. And it kind of get to the point where eventually you're just doing it by feel. You're going and you're like, until eventually you know, it feels like it needs more and it feels like it needs more. And then eventually you kind of get to the spot where you're like, it feels like it's done. Okay. And I think that's pretty close. All right. So with that done, that's the basics of the paint done. This can be put on the shelf and you can put a car on it right now and, and it'll look pretty good. I am taking it to the next, uh, instead of cork, uh, I know that there's like textured rubber mat that you can get that that will work pretty good. Um, I'm trying to think of like anything else that would, that would kind of simulate the same texture. 
you could use just uh your base coat could be a sort of just like textured paint uh like that rubberized undercoat that i've used in the past it does provide a bit of texture i think if if you were willing to kind of go through and do the, the extra painting on top of it the weather the the rubberized undercoating could potentially work that stuff fumes for a while um where like a, a a primer on cork like this, you know, after half an hour of drying, you can. I'm working on it in the living room, and it's and it's not causing any problems. But that that rubberized undercoat, you got to let it sit for a few days out in the garage or, or outside to really kind of vent off. Um. Other than that, I guess any kind of uh, any type, maybe even textured paper would potentially work. Uh, yeah, I can I can definitely go over some lines. Uh, what I like to use for lines are these uh, Sharpie paint pens. They're oil based, and yeah, there was this the fine tip. Where are we at? Yeah, fine point. Let's see, there we go. Fine point, just white oil based Sharpie paint pens. Um, these work really well. What I find with these is that the, they lay down a line that's inconsistent, which is nice for this type of texture. I mean, you can do a sharper line with, uh, like masking tape and, and paint. If you're looking for a kind of a, a newer, more freshly painted or freshly paved. But if you are looking for weathered, uh, this lays down a nice uneven line and it's, it's, it's thick enough of a paint that it that it stands up well against this background, like it covers well, but it's still thin enough that it doesn't just like, it doesn't look perfectly fresh. Like the first time, like you can go over it a couple, a couple lines to really kind of build up layers of it to get the, the, the opacity, I guess, opacity that you want. Um, the next step that I would do generally, uh, on here would be one of two ways. I would either add some lines or uh, I like to do some washes to add either uh, puddles or tire marks, that type of thing, because um, I think that really kind of adds that, that lived-in feel. What I like to do for that is I've already got some, some black paint left over from when I was working earlier. I use kind of the same small brush that I was using before, um, something that's about the width of a tire, in scale is a great option. Excellent. Okay, so then I take my water and I just wanna water down some of my black paint so that I'm making a, a wash out of it. Acrylic works really well this way. It, it waters down to where it can be almost invisible up to the same, you know, up to full-blown opaque paint. Taking my thin brush, kind of get in there. And then you can just do real simple like that. And what's nice is because this is mostly water that I laid down. As it dries, it's going to become less and less visible. Alternately, if I feel like I put too much down, I can just come in with paper towel and I can dab away that water before it has a chance to dry. And now you can see it's it's very, very subtle, but at the same time, you know what it is. You know that, you know, somebody skidded right there. They stopped real fast or they did a burnout. Um, you know, you can add some kids were ripping donuts in the parking lot. You can add those kind of marks. And then using your paper towel, if it's standing out too much, you can dab it. You can also come in with a clean brush uh, with some water on it and uh, and kind of spread out spread out your paint a little bit too. Uh, the paint actually holds up really well. Uh, some of the the first things that I did of this technique uh, for 3D bot maker are still being used and they hold up uh, really well. Like I said with, with constant handling, especially like on the sharp edges, uh, little pieces will continue to kind of to, to, to break off every once in a while. You can either go in with uh, just black and and fill those in and they disappear pretty readily. Or you can kind of just not even worry about it. Like here, I'll even, as an example, 
I'll chip that out. And so I chipped out a little piece right there and I know it's there and that catches my eye and it stands out. But, you know, like I said, to a casual observer, because everything else is already so weathered, that might not even stand out to them. But like I said, you can always just come in, a little dab of black paint and fixes it right up. So real easy, uh, easy to, to, to kind of maintain a, a certain level of, you know, where it, so it's still presenting the way you want it to. But as far as I'm trying to think, I've got, I just sent someone recently, I had one left of these like mini, like kind of, there was a section of road uh, that I had done as some of the first kind of dioramas that I was doing. And uh, God, those were a couple years ago. And I had, I just recently sent one to someone and it was still, I, it's, if you look a lot of the pictures that are on my, on my feed of like cars going around just like a little bit of corner, I've been using that same little mini diorama for a couple of years and uh, it's held up great. And I take that thing outside and roll cars around on it and take pictures of it and dropped it more times than I care to admit, but uh, holds up pretty good. All right, so you can see as that paint, those uh, those washes dry, they're just that little subtle bit that really kind of brings it together and and kind of adds that that really nice that lived in world kind of feel. From this point, you can excuse me, like I said, add excuse me, add lines. You can uh, if you wanted to add any type of like flocking. Um, like the the green kind of sawdust flocking that's out there, a little bit of that in some of the cracks to give that feel or even some static grass in the cracks just to feel, depending on what your overall setting is like, if you've got, you know, lush vegetation in your diorama immediately over here, there's a good chance that there's going to be stuff growing in these cracks. Um, so that kind of helps make it part of whatever, you know, the, the little world that you're building. Um, so that's a good, a good thing to, to try. Um, I'm going to do some lines on here though, uh, some line work with my pen. I need to go grab real quick though, my small ruler. I'll be right back. Okay, so I find just a, a, a nice sm small metal edge ruler is really handy for, for laying in lines because it allows you, I guess masking tape could also work, but masking tape is going to run the risk of kind of peeling up a little bit. So when I'm laying out my parking space lines or whatnot, what I'll do is I'll lay down reference marks either with a pencil or just like with a little dab of the white paint, you know, at all of the, the the points where I'm going to, so for instance, like diagonal parking spaces, I usually do them at uh, two inches wide and three inches, three inches deep, but with an offset of uh, one inch. So I would do, you know, a mark at four and a mark at six, and then three inches down, I would have a mark at five and a mark at seven, so that I'm connecting on the diagonal. When I have those two points. I would then just come in and line up with my ruler next to them and then freehand it, but just using my ruler kind of as a visual guide, knowing that I just want to stay next to the ruler, not necessarily painting onto the ruler, if that makes sense. Drink check, once again, Mountain Dew, delicious. Oh, um. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm actually not going to put any lines on this yet because I'm not 100% sure if my lines are going to be on this corner or if they're going to be on the other corner of this piece. So I'm going to hold off on doing any lines, any line work on here. But that's the, the, the general idea. And like I said, a light pass just very gently so that it's kind of hitting the, the high spots. And then once I have my initial line, I can take the ruler away and then I can come in and lay additional lines over. 
Awesome. You can also do uh, this regular kind of straight up. Actually, here, hold on. I'm gonna step away, I'll be right back. One more second, talk, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Okay, so, parking spaces. All right, so. For parking spaces. So if I've got the edge of my diorama, okay, and I wanna lay in a couple parking spaces. I, I would make marks at two inch increments. <coughs> like so. And then coming down. I would have planned ahead and had these measurements in uh, metric also if I had thought ahead. But of course I didn't. So I don't. And I apologize for anyone who would prefer metric. Okay, and then so now, so up here, I did every two inches, but I want these to be offset. So I'm gonna come in and do at one and three and at five and what would be seven. Okay, so I don't know, hopefully you guys are able to see this. So I've got reference marks there and there, and there. So I would lay my my ruler down and then connect. And connect. Doing some super squiggly lines, sorry about that. And connect. So, so I end up with this spacing seems to really work well for 164th parking lots, especially for display purposes. Um, I grab a couple. Okay, we're gonna do. This is gonna be a. This is gonna be a weird flex for for the Hot Wheels guys in here. So, uh, you take your your convention piece A100s you know, that you may be spent more on than you're willing to admit to yourself or your loved ones. And uh, you can see that the that that spacing works well enough that in a display, you're still able to see all of the cars. I mean, you could make these parking spaces, you know, one and a half inches wide and just cram cars into a space and maybe fit more cars on whatever size diorama you're working with. But if the whole point is to be able to see the cars... You know, that little bit of extra spacing really does make a difference for being able to see, you know, the whole point of, of being able to see the cars that you're working with. Um, so, yeah. So these are two inch by three inch this way. I mean, I can sketch that on here. So two inch by three inch. And then... This offset is one inch. Yes, there will always be some vans. That's rest assured. There will always be some vans. So yeah. So anyway, uh, does anybody have any questions or anything? I think that's about as much painting as I'm going to do like on the live stream. Um, it's a, a just a bunch more of the same. And doing it around the phone is kind of a tricky thing. So um, sorry for people that are just joining right now. Uh, I love vans. That's the particular reason that I think they're the perfect vehicle. They're utilitarian. 
and they have room on the side for murals of dragons and sorceresses and barbarian princesses and what have you. Um, I used to have a Dodge A100, I had a 67, and I loved it, but the time came where I needed to sell it, and so I did, and I miss it. And so the A100 has a especially special place in my heart and within my collection, um, but just vans in general. I drive a van right now, uh, Grand Caravan, and I love it. But yeah, no, vans are great. Uh, yeah. What makes a van a Hot Wheels three? It is also a Hot Wheels thing, that too. What makes, what'd you say? What, what, what specifically about like die cast vans? Oh, my, my wife is asking what specifically about die cast vans makes them great. And I think realistically, especially, you know, there's a reason that when Hot Wheels is doing uh, like a pop culture set, you know, to highlight, you know, movies or music or, or whatever. I mean, they're great. They're just canvases. I mean, look at this thing. You got big flat panels where you can do anything from, you know, line work to characters or whatever pictures on the side. They're they're great. And look, it looks like a little lunchbox It's adorable. How could you not love vans? You don't. If you don't love vans. You come find me. I'll fight you. <laughs> oh, I'm being told that I should show my my A100 collection. So I'm gonna take you guys over to show you. So I'm gonna take these back. So I have a shelf in the living room where I've got my A100 collection. So I've got all of the Hot Wheels variations, except for the purple one of this one from Japan, which I'll probably never get because it's stupid expensive. I've got customs by some of the best builders out there and I feel very, very privileged. Oh, speaking of, hello, DT99 Race. I'm still waiting to hear back from you about if you wanna make me an A100. Look, I've got plenty of room. And uh, these are all the M2s. Uh, I've got the, the new mellow yellow one is actually coming in the mail. And then I just saw there's another new Pan Am one that I'm gonna track down. So I found this, that's, that's a Dodge van. And then up here, I've got some more Dodge vans. Can you tell them I'm a Mopar guy? Anyway, oh, and then I also like Led Zeppelin. And so of course I've got the Zeppelin vans. <laughs> so at any rate thank you guys for hanging out i hope that this answered some of your questions um about how it is that i make this pavement um i hope that you guys are of a mind to try making some yourself i look forward to to seeing what you guys all come up with if anybody tries it and they're like man this way of doing this is dumb i found this other way that's better please tell me because i'm always down to learn a better way so Excellent. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Really appreciate all of your hanging out and asking questions and just kind of being involved with the with the process. Smitty, keep me posted on your on your progress. I'm looking forward to seeing seeing what you make. Uh, two millimeter cork uh, at Michaels. You can get a two foot by four foot roll for under twenty dollars. Uh, it. I will record it and I think what I'll do is I'll try to post it over on my YouTube channel because I don't know what we're coming up. I think we're coming up on an hour. Um, I think I can put it on here too. But yeah, I will make this available um, in some way or another. So you can put it on your feed. Yeah. So again, thanks everybody. Enjoy your Sunday. I don't know if you can hear my cat yelling into the ether. I say, I say bye. My wife, Stephanie, tells everybody thanks for hanging out. You guys all have a lovely evening. Thanks.